Thank you very much for your kind invitation also to Dr. Maninder Kalkat, who kindly inv invited me to this session. And the title is Pushing the Boundaries in Surgical Management of Lung Cancer. And already on my way here, I think I pushed certain boundaries <laughs> to arrive uh, in time. So I have no disclosures or no conflicts of interest, but I am a surgeon who believes in surgery for non-small cell lung cancer. Can I go to the next? Okay. I would like to start with a rather provocative statement from one, I think, most influential surgeons in, in the UK. It's Peter Goldstraw. You see him here at his retirement. And he said that surgery is the only prospect of cure in a patient with lung cancer. And for a certain degree, this still holds true today. So pushing the boundaries, uh, when we talk about lung cancer and surgery, lobectomy is generally regarded as the standard of treatment. So pushing the boundaries can be to the micro or the macro cosmos. So what I would like to discuss with you is T1A lung cancer. So can we do less than a lobectomy, so smaller resections, and then look at larger resections, locally advanced disease. Uh, what about what is the current stage is about oligometastatic disease, and lastly, uh, salvage surgery. So first of all, T1A lung cancer. These uh, are the survival curves of the lung cancer study group, which were updated, as you can see, the initial paper was published in 1995. It was updated in 1996. And you can see that when you compare lobectomy versus limited resection for overall survival, in fact, there was no real significant difference, but there was a difference in disease-free survival, which was as the, at the borderline of significance. But from that time on, lobectomy was regarded in an operable patient to be the standard of care for a tumor that could be completely removed by lobectomy. And then came the screening trials, and surgeons are more and more confronted with uh, smaller lesions, and the question is, what to do, for example, with the ground glass opacities or the ground glass nodules? Defined as a focal nodular area of increased attenuation on chest CT scan, as shown over here. But the normal parenchymal structures are completely uh, conserved, so they can easily be visualized. And it's a predominant, when you look at the component of growth, it's a lipidic or butterfly component. Previously, it was also called bronchial viral cell carcinoma, but this term is now considered to be obsolete because it gave rise to a lot of confusion. And in fact, there is a transition from pure ground glass opacity, so pure GGO lesions, to mixed lesions, so part solid lesions. We are partially malignant or considered to be invasive to completely solid lesions, which are in fact invasive tumors. So we now know that there is an increasing malignant potential going from one lesion to another. So this is the new adenocarcinoma classification introduced in 2011 and was completely adopted by the WHO in 2015. So distinction is made between pre-invasive lesions, minimal invasive adenocarcinoma, and invasive adenocarcinoma, as for example also done in breast cancer. Pre-invasive lesions are the atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, which was already known, but now comes also the adenocarcinoma in situ with a maximum diameter of three centimeters, so formerly called bronchial virus cell carcinoma. And then in between is the MIA, the minimal invasive adenocarcinoma, with a maximum of five millimeters invasion and also a maximum diameter of three centimeters. So meaning when you have a GGO larger than three centimeters, it's currently considered to be an invasive tumor. So what is important is that extensive sampling is needed for the pathologist to exclude invasion, especially when we talk about minimally invasive uh, carcinomas, particularly in larger tumors. And that's a problem when you perform frozen section analysis. For example, you remove a tumor by VATS, and the pathologist will not always be sure whether there is an invasive component or not. These are the survival curves of the ATNM classification, and for T1 and T2 tumors, there's now a distinction, a cutoff of one centimeter between T1A, T1B, and T1C. And as you can see, the survival for pathological proven T1A lesion is more than 90%. So it seems to be that there's something peculiar with the smaller tumors, and probably we can do a lesser resection. 
and is less a resection oncologically valid? And in fact, to know the correct answer, we have to wait for two large trials, one in the US and one in Japan, who completed now, but we have to wait for the survival data, and this will take several years. This is one of the meta-analyses that has been published, and I think it's an interesting one. They compared overall survival and cancer-specific survival of stage one tumors after sublobectomy, so meaning wide wedge excision or anatomical segmentectomy or lobectomy. There were 24 eligible studies with more than 11,000 patients. When they looked overall at stage one, there was a clear benefit of lobectomy on overall survival and cancer-specific survival with an hazard ratio of 1.4. But when they looked at that time for the seventh edition, tumors smaller than or equal to two centimeters, in fact, there was no difference in overall survival between lobectomy and sublobectomy. And when they compared lobectomy with anatomical segment segmentectomy, again, no difference in overall survival or cancer-specific survival. So the conclusion of this meta-analysis was that for stage 1A, until two centimeters, sublobectomy is probably similar to lobectomy. But again, the issue has not been definitely settled yet. Next topic, locally advanced uh, disease, and I suppose that uh, Professor Cassivi will go into more detail. I will just show you a meta-analysis published in 2017, six randomized trials of more than 1,300 patients, and it's interesting because they compared surgery with radiotherapy as local treatment modalities within a combined modality regimen for stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer. There was no difference in overall survival and progression-free survival between surgery and radiotherapy. And as we know from the large randomized trials, as well the EORTC as the ISLC, uh, the intergroup trial, there's an excess early mortality in the surgical arm. So they concluded that the induction therapy followed by either resection or definitive chemoradiation of valid treatment options. This is an update of the British Thoracic Society Lung Cancer Specialist Advisory Group regarding clinical and two non-small cell lung cancer. And they state that, of course, it's a complex heterogeneous patient population, so the trials have to be interpreted with caution. There's no randomized trial comparing single station versus multi-station and two disease. So they conclude, conclude that when you have a fit patient with potentially resectable clinical N2, that as well bimodality or trimodality treatment are valid. So consisting trimodality in chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery, or bimodality treatment, chemotherapy, followed by radiotherapy or surgery. So every patient should be discussed at an MDT, and all the patients should also be informed by a thoracic surgeon together with the oncology team. Regarding the oligometastatic disease, which is a controversial topic for the moment and hotly debated at major conferences, in the eighth edition of the TNM classification, M1B was redefined as a single extrathoracic metastasis in a single organ. So one metastasis in one extrathoracic organ. When you have multiple extrathoracic metastases, this is now considered to be M1C, defined as M1C, and to be going to stage um, 4B. There was no changes in M1A regarding the separate tumor nodules or the pleural pericardial nodules or malignant pleural or pericardial effusion. So what is the evidence we have for local therapy in oligometastatic non-small cell lung cancer. And as far as I know, this is the only randomized trial looking at this specific issue. It's a multi-center randomized phase two study from three hospitals. Inclusion criteria were patients with stage four non-small cell lung cancer with a maximum of three metastatic lesions after standard first-line systemic therapy. They had a good performance status, no progressive disease, and the patients were randomized between local consolidation, could be radiotherapy or surgery or a combination of both for certain metastasis, and 24 patients to maintenance treatment. So local therapy was surgery, radiotherapy or combination, and maintenance was a predefined list of approved uh, regimens taking into account mutations as EGFR, ALK mutations, or the patient could just be observed further. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival, Second, the endpoints were overall survival, safety, tolerability, quality of life, 
life, time to progression, and also time to appearance of new lesions. And regarding the results, the median follow-up was 12.4 months, or so one year. <coughs> median progression-free survival, as you can see, there was a highly statistically significant difference between local consolidation and maintenance treatment. Also, the one-year progression-free survival, 48% for local consolidation and 20% for the maintenance. Time to appear of appearance of new lesions was one year for local consolidation, which is rather surprising, and only six months for the maintenance treatment. Because those differences were statistically significant, the trial, unfortunately, due to a few number of patients, but was stopped after an interim analysis. So the questions that remain and, and questions I have is, are distant metastases completely independent of the primary tumor? Is there some kind of one-way or even a two-way interaction between the primary tumor and the metastatic disease? We know that some tumors can uh, excrete some vesicles which can be, can be interpreted by the metastatic disease. Major question is, when we have a better control of the primary tumor, can it reduce the growth of metastatic disease? And aggressive local therapy in patients with uh, oligometastatic disease, will it increase disease-free or overall survival? Last topic, salvage surgery. I will show you a dramatic case which we encountered several years ago. And I like to show this case because it's important when you discuss patients, in fact, who are operable with stage 3 and 2 disease and when they're only treated by chemo radiation. It's a 39-year-old female patient, 25 pack years. She was diagnosed with adenocarcinoma T1 and 2 on clinical grounds. It was multi-level N2, stage 3A. There were no distant metastases. She was treated with induction chemotherapy consisting of cisplatin pemetrexet and radiotherapy, followed by radiotherapy 30 sessions. Then after several months, an infiltrate developed in the right upper lobe, as you can see here. And the question was, is this radionumonitis or is there a, a cavity that is forming? Or is it progressive disease? In October, she came back with purulent cuff, hemoptysis, a clear necrotic cavity, and a lung abscess. So then the patient was referred to surgery because there was no other option of chemotherapy or radiotherapy, or to treat her only with antibiotics or antimycotics. So we performed the thoracotomy. We had to do an intrapericardial pneumonectomy, but due to the dense fibrosis around the, the hilum, there was a tear in the proximal pulmonary artery. We had to clamp the artery between the superior vena cava and the aorta, had to put the patient on bypass to suture the origin of the right pulmonary artery. She recovered. We put an irrigation system in place because culture showed not only fungi but also resistant bacteria. And on pathology, there were multiple nodules of adenocarcinoma in the remaining lung and lymph node station 7, so the subcranial lymph node station was still involved. So this was a YP, T3, and 2, M0. She was discharged on postoperative day 30, but unfortunately, several months later, she developed diffuse bone metastasis, and she was treated with palliative radiotherapy. So salvage surgery after definitive chemo radiotherapy is really at the boundary of what we can do as thoracic surgeons. There are no big series for the moment on this specific topic. This is one from Milano from the group of uh, Spagiari published by Dr. Cassiraghi, looking at 35 patients with lung cancer recurrence after definitive chemo radiation with cisplastin-based chemotherapy followed by a median of 58 grays of radiotherapy. There were six exploratory thoracotomies, 29 patients at lung cancer resection by lobectomy or bilobectomy, 12 cases, but 17 patients needed a pneumonectomy, as in our case, seven on the right side, 10 on the left side. 45% of the patients had extended resection, meaning intrapericardial resection of superior vena cava, trachea, chest wall, and so on. Our zero resection was obtained in 77% of the patients. The median time to chemo radiation and resection was seven months in this series. Important is, I think, that viable tumor was still found in approximately 90% of the cases. 30-day mortality was 5.7% which is excellent, but this is a real center of excellence. Nine patients had major complications. 
two and three year survival rates after our zero resection were 46 and 37 percent. So they concluded that salvage surgery after definitive chemo radiation, so a distinction should be made between salvage surgery after stereotactic radiotherapy for smaller lesions. This is locally extensive disease. It is feasible with an acceptable complication and survival rates, but those patients should be treated in uh, dedicated and experienced centers. So in conclusion, for the boundaries of surgical management, looking at T1A disease, there's a new adenocarcinoma classification with introduction of adenocarcinoma in situ and minimal invasive adenocarcinoma. In the ATNM classification for T1 and T2 tumors, there's a one centimeter increment. Lobectomy is still the gold standard for solid and invasive lesions, more than two centimeters. For sublobal resection, so anatomical segmentectomy or white wedge excision is still under evaluation, and we wait for the results of the large trials. Locally advanced disease, although there are randomized controlled trials, treatment should still be individualized, and every patient should be discussed at an MDT. For oligometastatic disease, a single metastasis in a single organ is now defined as the M1B category, and probably there's a role for local ablative therapy, surgery, and radiotherapy, or a combination of both. Salvage surgery can be indicated in selected patients when no other options are available. Thank you for your attention.